Well, good morning again, folks. Good morning. I'm not going to try to trick you like Mr. Trent did and Mr. Porter. <laughs> it is morning. <clears throat> I've been in and associated with the churches of our tradition for almost 40 years. And I'm just a youngster. I see a lot of you old folks out there. <laughs> been here longer than me <clears throat> but you know we've been through a lot we've seen a lot and a lot of us have been hurt we've been kicked around and abused and taken advantage of by other people even by some people that's in the church now I'm not saying this to criticize any facet of God's church for all of the different segments of God's church that I've been associated with, I have grown and I have learned many things. For it is through God's church in which I learned the basics of Christianity and how the basics of my salvation and much, much more besides. And I know you folks have too. You and I, the people sitting here, have seen many people get discouraged and leave. Go back to the world <clears throat> and just, they seemingly just disappear. And it is you and I who have endured. And of course, we've got a lot more enduring to do too, but we have endured and we have come out on the other side far stronger than we were. We are much stronger Christians with our faith not only intact but it is much much stronger as well and along the way we have come to realize some of what we taught was not on the up and up I've had people tell me Arden what you're doing what you're saying is not what we were taught well when I was in school I was taught I descended from a monkey but that don't make it so, does it? You get the point. Some of us, or rather some of the things we were taught, we now realize wasn't on the up and up. Now, these things of which I speak weren't taught to us in any malicious way. They weren't. They weren't taught to us in any way to purposely deceive us. <clears throat> It was just because through misunderstanding of, you know, the, of, of what someone misunderstood of what they were reading in some cases, and in their zeal, sometimes they couldn't resist the urge to embellish it just a little bit. <laughs> but again, it wasn't purposely to deceive us. Now, as we read through the Bible, we can see that it is, it is full of analogies and metaphoric language. A good example of this, and to get a good feel of what I'm talking about, would be the parables <clears throat> which Jesus taught while here on this earth. He told stories which pertained mostly to the kingdom of God, the coming kingdom of God. Now, the stories he told weren't actually real events. They were only analogies or something to be compared to the real thing or to explain how the real thing functioned. And no, Jesus did not tell a lie as my late brother-in-law tried to convince me of when he told these parables because they weren't actually real. He told these stories to explain to his disciples the function of the kingdom of God and to hide the meaning from the general public because of the hardness of their hearts. But as we read through the Bible, <clears throat> we can see the whole of Scripture, not just the New Testament alone, is full of analogies and metaphoric language. Much of end-time prophecy is given to us metaphorically. And all these analogies are presented to us sometimes as physical, the physical being compared to the physical, and sometimes as the spiritual 
being compared to the spiritual. Now, King David in Psalms gives us many analogies. In chapters 5 and verse 9, David, <coughs> speaking of his enemies, said this. He says, their throat is like an open tomb. Now, their throat wasn't, you know, it was not really like an open tomb, but we understand the analogy. The analogy was, <coughs> they were speaking perverse and deceitful things, and their mouth was full of cursing and bitterness. In Psalms 18, again, David, speaking of God, 18, verses 1 and 2, says, I will love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress, my deliverer, my God, my strength in whom I will trust, my buckler, or rather armor. He is my armor, and he is the horn of my salvation and my high tower. Now, again, the Lord is not really a rock. He's not really a fortress. He's not a suit of armor or a horn or a high tower. David is telling us the Lord's strength is solid as a rock. It is the Lord's strength which protects him from his enemies. It is, and the Lord protects him like a suit of armor. And as if he were in a high place where no one could touch him as a high tower. And the horn is used by the might of some animals to fight and defend themselves. Therefore, it is God, of God's might of which he says he receives his salvation. But, not, but God is not actually a horn or any of these other things. These are only a few examples of analogies. The Bible is literally full of these kinds of comparisons, hundreds of them. Some, as I said, some physical in comparison to physical, and some physical in comparison to spiritual. So keep that in mind. So out of all these hundreds of analogies given to us from the Bible, I'd like to take just one. Well, I'll, I'll focus on some more, but one is, the one is my purpose. And I'd like to focus on that today. And this analogy of which I'm referring to, I feel has often been shunned in the churches of God. And there is no other analogy I can think of which has greater significance or meaning or can give us a greater comparison and comprehension of the fall holy days, especially the Feast of Tabernacles. But some ministers in the past, I feel, have shunned this analogy, and they've stepped around it in their preaching. And there is no other analogy, as I said, that can have greater meaning. Now, before I tell you what that is, I'd like to address why they shunned this analogy, as well as many other analogies that are so clearly present in the Word of God. First of all, the leadership of the church again, in their zeal, were so adamant about the appearance of the church standing out and above the rest of the religious community, they, we were taught not to do certain things because that's what the Protestants did. The Protestants do that. You don't do that. That's what the Protestants believe. So don't do that. Well, I'm not going to argue the point. We certainly should be different than Protestants. <clears throat> and we certainly are different than Protestants. And we do stand out as being different from the Protestants. But to d dismiss something which is so clearly present in the Bible just because the Protestants believe in it, well, I, you know, that, that's, I'm not even going to say the word. And again, I'm not up here to bash the churches of God. Believe me, I'm not. On the contrary, I love the churches of God. Every facet of the church of God of which I have been associated with in my 40 years in the church, I have loved and grown in knowledge of my Creator and His Son, Jesus Christ. And I command them all, however imperfect they were, or might have been. <clears throat> they were imperfect, just as we are imperfect, because they, 
these churches were operated by imperfect people. We as mortal beings are all imperfect. God's true church has always been run by imperfect people. And we all make mistakes, even in the interpretation of the Scripture sometimes. But that's not to say at times I have been naive and trusted my leadership when I should have been questioning what they were teaching me. We all have. And I dare say, you know, we've all been in that position. We all have been a little naive in our relationship with our leadership over the years. In the past, in our zeal to be different, when our leadership told us not to do or believe certain things because they were too Protestant, we went along with it. Didn't matter if that analogy was in the Bible. If the Protestants did it or the Protestants believed in it, we should have nothing to do with it. And folks, that's just plain wrong. If it's in the Bible, it's in the Bible. And it doesn't matter who believes in it or adheres to it. If it's there, then it's there. And we should accept what's there as well. If you adhere to what's in the Bible, it's not going to make you look like a Protestant. It's going to make you look like who you really are, a true Christian in the true church of God. I'm not a Protestant. Never have been, never will be. But to, de to deny and shun what's in the Bible just because the Protestants happen to believe in it as well is just plain wrong. And we were led down that path by some of our church leaders in the past, all in their zeal to look different. <laughs> There's been a lot of songs written about this analogy of which I'd like to address. And most of these songs have been written by no other than Protestants. A lot of them are good songs if you sing them having the right understanding. However, the problem lies in the people writing these songs. Most didn't understand the location of where they were writing about. And of course, some of those old gospel songs were just plain out and out lies. But a good example of this is the song Beulah Land. Some of you may know that song. It was written by a fellow named Squire Par Parsons back in the 90s. And it goes, <clears throat> I'm kind of homesick for a country, one I've never seen before. No sad goodbyes will there be spoken, and time won't matter anymore. Beulah Land, I'm longing for you, and on your bank someday I'll stand. There my home shall be eternal. Beulah Land, <clears throat> sweet Beulah Land. Now, Beulah Land is only mentioned in the Bible one time. It is mentioned in a partial of prophetic prophecy about Jerusalem. Isaiah 62, starting in verse 1, if you want to follow me. <clears throat> Isaiah 62, starting in verse 1. It says, For Zion's sake will I not hold my peace, and for Jerusalem's sake I will not rest until the righteousness thereof goes forth as brightness, and the salvation thereof as a lamp that burns. And the Gentiles shall see your righteousness, and all kings your glory. Now let's stop there for just a minute and ask ourselves, why is Jerusalem going to be as bright as a lamp and be such a righteous and glorious place? It's because that is where God's headquarters is going to be in the real Feast of Tabernacles. Now going on here, it says, And you shall be called by a new name, which the mouth of the Lord shall name. You shall also be a crown of glory in the hand of the Lord, a royal diadem in the hand of your God. You shall no more be termed forsaken, neither shall your land any more be termed desolate. But you shall be called Hephzibah, which means my delight is in her. And your land, Beulah, for the Lord delights in you. And your land shall be married. And that's what the word Beulah means. It means to be married. 
For as a young man marries a virgin, it says, so shall your sons marry you. And as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall your God rejoice over you. I have set a watchman, that's you and I, folks. I have set a watchman upon your walls, O Jerusalem, which shall never hold their peace day or night, that make mention of the Lord, and they keep not silence, and give him no rest till it be established, until he makes Jerusalem a praise in the earth. <laughs> now, some of this may be a little hard to understand, but it's basically saying when Jesus Christ comes back to this earth, he's going to make Jerusalem a place of beauty. And it has to be, for it's going to be his headquarters, you know, from which he will rule the earth. In the book of Revelation, it tells us, living water shall flow from Jerusalem, which represents the true way of life. And before we're through, maybe we'll get over there. But he tells us his people will be married to the land. We will be associated with the land or from the place on this earth which this true way of life will flow from. And in the extension of this analogy, we will be married to God's system and his way of doing things, which will be according to his laws. Jerusalem and all associated with it will be a land married to the ways of God. And we are to be watchmen, teaching and preaching that way of true life, day and night. We are not to be silent about this event which is coming until the very day it becomes a reality, until Jerusalem becomes a praise in the whole earth. And that's what we strive to do in our church. We try to do that. This is what God tells us our job is now. We are to watch and preach about this coming event. And again, that's what the Church of New World Ministries tried to do. Preach and teach about the coming of a new age in which Christ will rule this world. And that's what the Feast of Tabernacles is about, folks. Now, back to the song Beulah Land. It's a beautiful song. It has a beautiful chord progression. But when Squire Parsons wrote that song, I don't think he had any idea of what it meant. I may be wrong, but I don't think he understood of what, anything of what we just read. To him, Beulah Land means passing from this physical life, crossing the river, become spiritual, and going to heaven. And that's not what it means at all. But that's his take on it. And it is a beautiful song, if you, can, if you sing it with the right understanding. He may have part of it right, but he's got the place all wrong. And over the years, we've been taught, and rightly so, that the Israelites coming out of Egypt represented coming out of sin. That's true. And we've been taught about all these other analogies of their physical existence representing the spiritual part of our lives. However, when it comes down to the end of the story, some were reluctant to address the crossing of the river and entering into the promised land. And it was nothing more than the fear of looking like and believing in something of which the Protestants addressed so strongly. And again, that's wrong. And that's what I want to talk about, the analogy of crossing the river into that spiritual promised land. To understand the whole process, process of salvation, You've got to look at the whole story. That's why you can't dismiss not even one of the holy days. And you can't dismiss any analogy out of the story of the Israelites coming out of Egypt either. That's what the story of the Israelites is all about. It represents us from the day we were called till the day we enter in to the kingdom of God. The only problem in the past, all the different analogies of the story were never told. Some were, but they just couldn't get to the end, seemingly, because the Protestants believed in it so strongly. Some of these analogies, as I said, is about coming out of Egypt, represented coming out of sin, and rightly so. 
they were highly emphasized. Some of the others hardly at all, especially the one of which the Protestants are so big on, as I said, crossing the river from physical to spiritual and entering into the Promised Land. Over in 1 Corinthians, we read about some of this and how the story is for our example. The whole story, people, not just part of it. Moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant, he says. Paul, this is Paul speaking. Moreover, brethren, I would not have you be ignorant or should be ignorant. He's telling the Corinthians here, he wants them to understand how it is. How that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. And were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. And did eat. All, or did all eat the same spiritual meat or spiritual food? And did all drink the same spiritual drink? For they drank of that rock, spiritual rock, that followed them. And that rock was Christ. So, we came out of Egypt. We came out of sin. Then we were baptized into the fellowship that Moses had with Christ. And we now drink from that spiritual rock us as well as them, which is the laws of God, which are written in the book on your lap. But then verse 5 tells us, most of them that came out were not accepted by God. It says, but with many of them, God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Numbers 14, 29, and 32, I'm not going to turn there, I'm not asking you to turn there either, but it tells us that the desert was strewn with their corpses. They died in the wilderness, most of them. Now, you and I sitting here today, we have all known a lot of people, hundreds of people, who used to be in the congregation of God who are no longer around. They are not here, for God was not well pleased with them. They may have put on an air of truth at one time, but their hearts were, someone, were somewhere else. Their hearts were not fully in tuned and right with God. I've seen this in my own family. My sister, whom I love very much, I saw, I saw her go back to the world. She started putting up her little tree and observing Christmas again after being exposed to the truth. And the Sabbath and the holy days no longer meant anything to her either. She's now dead. You know, when people quit keeping God's holy days, they lose all track and all sight of God. If you give up the plan, you lose track of everything. You lose track of God's true purpose. <laughs> One of my brothers went back to working on the Sabbath and lost all track of the holy days as well. After being exposed to the truth, he's dead also. Now, I'm not saying that God killed them, but they're both passed away now. Verse 6. Now, these things were our examples. To the intent we should not lust after evil things. I'm sorry to the intent we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Paul is telling the Corinthians and us folks as well, if our hearts are somewhere else besides on the things of God, God is not pleased with us, especially after we have been exposed to the truth. Mr. Hicks and I were talking a few minutes ago. Once you've been exposed to it, once you live it, you can't go back. There is no turning around. You cannot go back. You must push forward. Verse 7 tells us we cannot be idlers, idolaters, I'm sorry, as they were, speaking of the ancient Israelites. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. <clears throat> and Paul is quoting Old Testament here. He's speaking of the time when the Israelites made a golden calf after coming out of Egypt, coming out of sin, but they wanted to turn around. Well, they did turn around and went back to their old habits of idol worship. 
We can't be like the Israelites, folks. We can't come out of sin and then go back to idolatry. And a Christmas tree and all these other ways of the world are nothing but idolatry. The story of the Israelites coming out of Egypt and their life in the wilderness is filled with analogies of our spiritual lives as we make our own journey to the promised land. We cannot ignore them. It is the story of our spiritual life. The Israelites coming out of Egypt is the story of our spiritual life. Verse 8, Paul says, Neither let us commit fornication, as some of them committed, and fell in one day three and twenty thousand, twenty-three thousand people. Paul again is referring to Old Testament scripture here. He is talking about what happened in Numbers 25, 1 through 9. If you want to jot that down. When some of the Israelite men began, began to commit whoredom with some of the Moabite women and began to sacrifice and bow down to the idol Baal. God told Moses to, slow, to slay every man who had joined himself to the idol worship of Baal. This is, what, this is what they had to do to keep the infiltration of Baal worship from engulfing the whole congregation. Paul says 73,000 were slain. Over numbers, it says it was 24,000. Nevertheless, that's a lot of people. However, we can see how easy it is for idol worship to engulf an entire community or nation if it is left unchecked. And folks, that is what has happened to our nation today. It has been left unchecked. It has been upheld by the highest leaders in the land. And look where we're at today. In one of my recent sermons, I mentioned how Baal worship is still alive and well here in the United States. It's just not called by that name. However, the same two main practices being committed is those of Baal worship in ancient times. In Baal worship, there were sexual orgies, and the children produced by these sexual orgies were then burned alive to the idol, Baal. Today, it's not called by that today. It is called sexual freedom and a woman's right to choose. The religion is called pleasure and convenience. The children produced by all this sexual freedom are then aborted in the most hideous ways, folks. Different name, same practices. But it is alive and practiced today by thousands of people. Verse 9, <clears throat> Neither let us tempt Christ, Paul says, as some of them also tempted and were destroyed of serpents. Again, Paul is using an analogy of what happened to the Israelites when they complained against God in the wilderness. And he, he was transferring it to the Corinthians and to us also. And if you want to jot that down, that's Numbers 21, 6, I think. Do we sometimes to complain? Do we sometimes complain about God as we journey through this wilderness that we're journeying through? Verse 10. Paul tells us, he said, Neither murmur you, as some of them murmured, and were destroyed of the destroyer. Boy, I'm glad none of us ever murmur, aren't you? I'm so glad of that. Again, Paul is using the example of the Israelites doing things of which we should not do on our journey to the promised land. Verse 11. Now all these things, he says, happen to them for our example. And they are written for our admonition, admonition upon whom the ends of the world has come. We are to learn from their examples and not make the same mistakes. And people, the end of the world, it would appear, is here, just about. And that's what it was written for, upon whom the ends of the world are come. That's us. It is for us, for we are living in the last days. The end of 6,000 years is almost up. The real promised land, 
That spiritual promised land is just around the corner. And all the things of how the Israelites and all the things which befell them because of their actions are here for us to see and use as a guideline on our journey to the spiritual promised land. Are we using them? Are we applying them in our lives? I certainly hope so. I for sure know that I need to. Verse 12, Paul says, Wherefore let him think he stands, take heed, lest he fall. You know, we get comfortable in our religion, don't we? We get so comfortable sometimes, you know, as if though we've already made it. And there's nothing more to do except sit around and wait for it to come to us. And I'll, I'll address some of that in my next sermon. But the story of the Israelites, how they came out of Egypt, all the pitfalls and problems they had as they traveled through the wilderness are there for us to see as we travel through our wilderness. <clears throat> and they tell us what to avoid if we ever truly want to enter the reality of the Feast of Tabernacles. <clears throat> that generation of Israelites which left Egypt never made it to the Promised Land, except, what, three or four, or something like that. <clears throat> and the reason they didn't is because they didn't want it. They didn't really want the Promised Land. They kept wanting to go back, go back to the ways of the world. Go back to Egypt. God offered, offered them freedom, and their answer was a flat-out no. We don't want it. They may not have said it, but they showed him by their actions. We don't want it. So he didn't give it to them. They didn't want it. He didn't give it to them. What is our answer? Do we want the freedom of being a spirit man in the family of God? Or do we want to stay under the slavery of Satan? That's the choice we have. You and I have seen a lot of people do that, haven't we? We've seen a lot of people that we used to go to church with go back to the ways of the world, go back to Egypt, go back to the slavery of Satan. How sad. The seed was sown, but it didn't fall on good ground. <clears throat> Will they ever make it? I don't know. I do know that this is our time of judgment, and we need to avoid the pitfalls of the Israelites in the wilderness, <clears throat> and to certainly have a different frame of mind than what those people had. Okay, <clears throat> we've looked at some of the analogies in the story of the Israelites as they came out of Egypt and sojourned in the wilderness. We've looked at some of the things they did and didn't do in their travels through the wilderness. And again, their journey reflects what you and I must do and not do on our journey to the kingdom of God. They left Egypt, which for us represents coming out of sin. They crossed the Red Sea. They were baptized in the Red Sea, so to speak which tells us we must be baptized if we are to continue on our journey. It's one of the things we must do. It tells us they all ate manna, that spiritual food which came down from heaven and drank from that spiritual rock. For us, that is the way of God. That is God's laws and commandments. We must drink of that and abide by it. And I've heard many sermons on some of these analogies. But when it came to the end of the story, when it came to the analogy of crossing over Jordan and entering into the Promised Land, they were so reluctant to teach that in comparison to us entering the Kingdom of God. Oh, they knew it was there, but it was something which was so big in the Protestant community, they were reluctant to preach it. They were afraid it might make us look Protestant. You know,
As I mentioned, the Protestants, Protestants have written literally hundreds, if not thousands, of songs on this one analogy. Crossing over Jordan into the Promised Land. And again, the only problem was they didn't have, where the, have any idea where the Promised Land was. They think it's up in heaven somewhere. But it's there, folks, and it's a great analogy for those of us who do understand it. And if we do understand it, why would we care? Who else believes in it? It's a great analogy, especially this time of year, for trumpets, atonements, and especially for the Feast of Tabernacles, all of which pictures the first fruits entering in to the kingdom of God. But how do we enter in? Moses tells us. He told them too, but they rejected what he told them. Back in Deuteronomy 1.1, 1, 1. <clears throat> it says, These be the words which Moses spoke unto all Israel on this side of Jordan in the wilderness. Well, that's where we are, folks. We've come out of Egypt. We've come out of sin by the mercy of God and his calling. We're in the wilderness. That's where we are, just on the other side of Jordan. That's where we are in this life because the end is near. The kingdom of God is just across the river. It's just around the corner. Verse 8, there in Deuteronomy 1. Behold, I have set the land before you. He has set the kingdom before us too, folks. He tells us here to go in and possess the land, possess the kingdom, which the Lord swore unto your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give them and to their seed after them. Verse 21, Behold, the Lord your God has set the land before you. Go up and possess it. As the Lord God of your fathers has said unto you, Fear not, neither be discouraged. We are here today because we did not get discouraged like so many of our brethren did. Then chapter 4, Deuteronomy, starting in verse 1. You know, he, he tells us how to do this. He says, Now therefore hearken, O Israel, unto the statutes and the judgments which I teach you. For to do, for to do them that you may live. And for us, folks, that would be live eternally. And go in and possess the land which the Lord God of your fathers gives you. God is telling us here, here it is. Go in and possess it. It is not beyond your grasp. The kingdom of God is not beyond our grasp. However, there are certain things we must do to go in. So we can see there are a set of rules we must adhere to if we are to enter in the kingdom of, to the kingdom of God. Verse 2. You shall not add unto the word which I command you, neither shall you diminish out from it, that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God which I command you. Moses is telling the Israelites how to go in and possess the land. He's telling us too. They never made it because they didn't adhere to God's way of life. So you want to cross the river, folks? You want to enter into the kingdom of God? Then keep his commandments, commandments as he has given them to us. We can't be like the Pharisees. We can't put a spin on the laws of God to suit ourselves. We must keep them as God has given them to us. That's what a lot of the Protestant community out there wants to do. Do away with the laws because to them they are an inconvenience. However, you can't do that and enter into the kingdom of God. If you do, you can't cross the river. You won't cross the river unless you obey God and his commandments. Verse 5, Behold, I have taught you statutes and judgments, even as the Lord my God commanded me that you should do so in the land where you go to possess it. When Christ comes back to this earth, folks, God's laws, are not, they're going to be ongoing. They're not going to be done away with. 
They're not done away with now, and they're not going to be done away with then. Verse 6, Keep them, therefore, and do them, for this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of all nations, which shall hear all these statutes and say, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. For what nation is there so great that has the statutes and judgment so righteous as all this law? which I set before you this day. Now, I know Moses was talking about a physical nation here. However, in Isaiah 2.2, it tells us about a time when the reality of the Fe Feast of Tabernacles finally comes, when the Lord's kingdom will finally be set up. It tells us, It shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains, and she shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow into it. Gentile nations as well, folks. Gentile nations will seek God as well. And many people shall go and say, Come, you, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord's, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he shall teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Again, folks, God's law has not been abolished, nor will it ever be. That is the set of laws of which we will rule this world in the real, in the real Feast of Tabernacles. Verse 8 here in Deuteronomy 4. And what nation is there so great that has the statutes and judgments so righteous as all these which I have set before you this day. Now, back at that time, there was no nation that had God's truth and laws and statutes and judgments. And I don't know of one today that has them. One nation, that is. The church has them, but no nation does. I'm going, to skip, well, I'm going to skip over some of this scripture for it says basically the same thing. But Let's go to one more set of scriptures. <clears throat> Chapter 6 in Deuteronomy. Starting in verse 1. <clears throat> Chapter 6 starting in verse 1. This is what we must do, folks, if we want to cross the river into the e eternal kingdom of God. It says, now these are the commandments, the statutes and the judgments which the Lord your God commanded to teach you, that you might do them in the land where you go to possess it, that you might fear the Lord your God to keep all his statutes and his commandments, which I command you, you and your son and your son's sons, all the days of your lives, that, you, that your days may be prolonged. And for us folks, that would mean our lives will be prolonged for eternity. Verse 3, Hear therefore, O Israel, and observe to do it, that, I may, that it may be well with you, and that you may increase mightily, as the Lord God of your fathers has promised you, in the land that flows with milk and honey. For them it was physical. For us it will be eternity, the real Feast of Tabernacles. Verse 5, And you shall love the Lord with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your might. And these words which I command you this day shall be in your heart. And that's why we're here today, folks. It's in our heart and in our minds. Verse 8 tells us, You shall bind them for a sign upon your hand, and they shall be frontlets between your eyes. In other words, they will be in your mind. And you shall write them up on the post of your house and on your gates. The emphasis is we are to in include God in everything we do in our in entire life. He is to constantly be on our minds throughout our entire life. Verse 17, you shall diligently keep the commandments of the Lord God and his testimonies and his statute, which he has commanded you. And you shall do that which is right and good in the sight of the Lord, that it may be well with you, 
and that you may go in and possess the good land which the Lord swore unto your fathers. And he brought us out from thence, speaking of Egypt to them, speaking of sin for us, that he might bring us in to give us the land which he swore to our, to our fathers, which for us is the kingdom of God. God has called us out of this world that he might bring us into his spiritual family. Verse 24, And the Lord commanded us to do all these statutes, to fear the Lord our God for our good always, that he might preserve us alive. And again, for us, that is to preserve us alive forever as a spirit being in the promised land, his spiritual kingdom. 25, and it shall be your righteousness if we observe to do all these commandments before the Lord our God as he has commanded us. So, how do we cross the river into the promised land? It is for certain we cannot be like the Israelites of old. They didn't want the freedom God had to offer them. They didn't want to keep his commandments. They just wanted to go back to Egypt, go back to paganism, back to the ways of slavery, go back to sin. That's what they wanted. To them, slavery was more convenient because they had someone to make the decisions in their lives. They were institutionalized like some convicts today who have been in prison for many, many years. They get used to someone telling them every facet of their lives and can't make decisions on their own. I understand that from a personal point of view because like Mr. Trent, I have worked in those, in those kinds of institutions in the, the correctional units. They call them that. They hardly correct anyone, but anyway. But that's what you and I have to do. We have to make the decision to go down the right road. And if we can do that and adhere to the laws of God, then we will cross over the river into the promised land. Those laws aren't going to get us there. Because God's salvation is a free gift. But folks, we have to keep those laws and commandments. We have to show God that we're dedicated to keeping those laws and commandments. For only then, for only the people that does that, will God even choose to give that free gift to. So, uh, again, we can't make the same mistakes as the Israelites did when they came out of Egypt. And again, that reflects our lives. We must do better than that. We must do far better than that. And I'll address that in my next sermon.